Welcome to the recorded version of Senior Nutrition and Meal Time, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Dr. Dupree is the Executive Director of the DAI Foundation, a nonprofit organization established to meet the needs of caregivers. She is also president of Dr. Amy Inc., a company dedicated to family caregiver wellness by providing access to information and education, services, support with emotional and family issues, and legal and financial support. Dr. Amy also holds a PhD and master's in social work, specializing in gerontology, and earned her CSA, a designation for which she also trains others as part of their accreditation. And at this point, I would like to turn the floor over to our presenter, Dr. Amy Dupree. Welcome, Dr. Amy. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. And I'm glad to be talking with all of you today about these issues. I've, I've spent over 25 years now working with older adults and their families, and I know these issues come up a lot. And I don't just know that professionally, I also know it personally, too, because I spent about a decade caring for my parents, and uh, my parents had uh, differing needs, but nutritional issues were, were something that came up over and over during the decade I spent caring for them. So a lot of these things that we're going to chat about today are, are tried and true for me, both from a professional standpoint and a personal. So I know that all of us have heard that adage that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And obviously it's true that getting enough fruits and vegetables in our diets, and also this is true for the diets of our aging relatives, is a really good thing and it should be a lifelong practice. But you know, as we age, our bodies and our internal systems slow down and they change. And of course, illnesses can pop up that require some modification in what we can and can't eat. And often we find that we don't have the same get up and go as we had, even as in midlife. So we need to reduce our caloric intake. Now, maintaining a good diet as we age can have lots of benefits. It can help us with our cognitive functioning. That's better. It can help us have better resistance to illnesses. We can find that our energy levels are better, that our, improve, our immune systems are improved and operate better, that we heal quicker from, from illnesses, and that we're better able to manage some chronic health issues. However, you may have found that encouraging your aging parents to eat well can be a real challenge. I'm sure that many of you family caregivers are worried that your mom or your dad's health is at risk because of an unhealthy diet. Maybe they eat too much fast food or they don't get enough fruits or vegetables or you just feel they don't have a variety in their diet to give them enough nutrients. And I know it's especially scary if your older relative has type 2 diabetes. You know, I know this caregiver, Sophie, who worried about her dad. And her mom had passed away a few years ago, and her dad never really had cooked when they were married. He's still learning to make meals for himself. And she says that half the time he survives on coffee and hot dogs. Not really a great diet, obviously. And he complains that food doesn't really taste good anymore. And because of all that, he's losing weight, and he's sitting in front of the TV a lot, so he's not very active. So Sophie keeps trying to encourage him to eat more healthy foods, but she doesn't really seem to be getting anywhere. Added to that, she's busy with her own family and with work, so she doesn't get to check on her dad as often as she'd like to. And diabetes runs in the family, and Sophie's worried that her dad is at real risk for this. Now, this caregiver may sound to you very familiar, because you may feel this way. You may be busy and trying to care for your parents as well as trying to run your own family and work, and you know there's things going on with your parents nutritionally, but you may not feel like you're getting to the bottom of it. So here's the good news. You don't have to be a nutritionist to help your aging parents with their diet. You really just need some simple guidance, which is what I'm going to give you today in this webinar. So let's take a look at what we're going to, what we're going to discuss today. First of all, I want to say that I'm going to talk about your aging parents, and it may be that you're caring for another older adult. It could be your spouse, or it could be another family member or a friend. So even though I'm going to say your mom or your dad or your aging parents, please know that I know that you could be caring for a variety of people. Okay, so what are we going to talk about during this webinar? Well, first, we're going to begin by talking about why proper nutrition is important and what can happen if your aging relative doesn't have good eating habits. So this information should help you help them understand why they need to be interested and aware about their diets. 
Then we're going to talk about some simple ways that you can help your parents shop for good food and eat right. And then at the conclusion, I'll give you some pointers from, for some specific dietary and health concerns, things such as diabetes. And I'll suggest some places that you can go for additional help and information. OK, so now let's get started by talking about why proper nutrition is so important. You know, as people age, there are, are a number of possible changes that take place that really can make eating less enjoyable. It can impact the appetites of older adults. And it can even make the act of cooking a meal feel more like a task than a feel-good situation. So let's talk about these changes and challenges in some specifics. First, let's talk about the lifestyle changes. If one of your parents has passed away, your other parent may not know how to cook, or they really just may not feel like cooking for one. A lot of people who've cooked for large families and then for a couple say, you know, I just don't enjoy this, cooking for one person. Or it may be that your older relative's on a limited budget, and they may have trouble affording balanced, healthy meals. You know, another thing that impacts all of this is activity levels. We know that activity levels can really impact health. Older people often cut back on activity for physical and medical reasons. The problem is if they continue to eat the same amount of calories, they start to put on weight. Increased weight also just comes with a normal slowdown in our metabolism because our body's burning fewer calories. That's why exercise is so important to fight that normal slowdown. Now, you may have noticed that as your parents age, their sense of taste and smell may also be getting worse. So what you may find is that they're inclined to season and salt their food a lot more heavily than before, even though they don't need that much salt, and certainly they don't need that much sugar if that's the, the, what they're putting uh, using on their food. So I'll tell you a story about my father when uh, my dad was quite elderly and really still in pretty good health. Uh, I took him out to breakfast on a regular basis. and. One of the times I took him out to breakfast, as soon as the eggs arrived, he took the salt shaker and immediately just kind of held it upside down on top of the eggs. See, the problem was he not only could no longer taste the salt that he was putting on his eggs, he also had macular degeneration that was impacting his eyesight. So he really didn't see that well, so he couldn't see the salt he was putting on his eggs. And you know, I used to talk to him about the need to be aware of how much salt he was eating for health reasons. He didn't have high blood pressure, but salt still isn't good for you, even if you don't have high blood pressure, in large quantities, of course. So I, I knew he couldn't see it or taste it, so I said, Dad, why don't you put it in your hand and then put it on the food? He didn't really think that was necessary, and I joked with him and told him that if he continued to do this, I, the good news was I thought he might live forever because he was really cured like a ham. But I did really continue to encourage my dad to cut back on the salt and, again, to use techniques like putting the salt in his hand so he could see that. It's hard, though, as people age, because they have lost their sense of taste and their sense of smell. And things just don't taste as good, so they do things to try to get that taste higher. Another potential concern when people have a diminished sense of taste and smell is they can't distinguish when food's gone bad. And that means they might eat something that makes them sick. Obviously, it also makes eating just less enjoyable, which means sometimes that people don't eat at all or they may not eat enough. And that can lead to weight loss that isn't good. It's weight loss when people get too thin. So it's important to realize also that changes in appetite can result from things having nothing to do with what we're talking about, but resulting from loneliness, or a medical condition, or some prescription medications. All of those things can impact appetite. That's why you almost need to be a little bit of a private detective when you're doing this. You need to kind of investigate what are the reasons if your parent stops eating well and they have eaten well, what are the reasons that's going on? Is it an emotional reason? Is it, a, is it a, something to do with their medication? Is it due with sensory changes? Another thing that happens is that there are changes in an older person's digestive system. And that can make it more difficult for them to process certain vegetables and minerals, things such as B12, B6, folic acid. And those things are necessary to maintain mental alertness they're also necessary just for a keen memory and good circulation. Now, as you hear this long list, you may say, wow, this is a bit overwhelming. But really, there are ways you can support your aging parents to help them overcome or reduce the impact of some of these factors. So now let's talk about some of the nutritional guidelines 
that can help with these challenges. So in general, some of the important nutritional guidelines for older adults include things like reducing sodium, salt, and that helps prevent water retention as well as the high blood pressure. Also monitoring fat intake to make, to, in order to make sure you have healthy cholesterol levels. You know, that's something that people need to monitor as they age, and I'm sure your, your parents, if they're getting good medical care, are having their cholesterol levels monitored. They also need to consume more calcium and vitamin D for their bone health and to eat more fiber-rich foods to prevent constipation, which can be a big issue, as you know, for older people. And obviously cutting back on sugar is important because of diabetes. Making sure they get the recommended amount of important vitamins and minerals, increasing water intake, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, and participating in regular physical activity. When we talk about this, we really mean at least 30 minutes three times a week. Now these guidelines may look really familiar to you because they're probably similar to what your doctor is talking about to you. So it doesn't change a lot as we get older in these ways, but the, the important thing, what happens is, is they become more important as we get older. These recommendations have um, impacts that are more key to our aging parents than they are even to us. So we know that health, healthy eating can keep your parents' body and mind sharp and extend their quality of life. And we know that both men and women need to practice, obviously, good eating habits. We also know there's a difference in the genders. There are some specific needs that are different between men and women. Now, of course, your parents should consult with their doctor to discuss what supplements and vitamins are best suited to their specific health needs. But here's some general guidelines that we can look at. In general, older men need calcium and vitamin D to help maintain strong and healthy bones. They also need fiber to help keep their bowel functions normal, and it's also good for their heart. Also, increasing potassium intake along with decreasing the sodium may help lower a man's risk of high blood pressure. For weight control and overall health, it's recommended that men should limit their fat calories to 20 to 35% of their diet. And of course, most of these fats should come from heart-healthy, unsaturated fats, things like extra virgin olive oil, canola oil, walnuts, almonds, avocados. Now, healthy older men without heart disease should limit their saturated fat, which comes from meat and full-fat dairy and fried foods, to just 10% of their total fat calories. That's healthy men. Men with high cholesterol need to reduce that even more, down to about 7%. Okay, now your mom. So thinking about your mom, we know that older women, on the other hand, benefit from a balanced and variety diet, and that should include plenty of fruits, plenty of vegetables, whole grains, lean protein, dairy, healthy fat, and fluids. In particular, we know that older women typically need calcium and vitamin D to keep their bones and teeth strong. They need zinc for wound healing and good vision. And they need vitamin B12 for energy and cognitive functioning. Older women often don't feel thirsty. So you might need to talk to your mom about this because even when they need fluids, your mom may not recognize she needs it. And that puts her at risk of dehydration, which happens pretty commonly in older people. So your mom needs to drink water and fluids, things like 100% juices. And they need, she needs to do that often throughout the day. Okay, so now we've reviewed some of the special nutritional needs older adults have. Let's talk about how to spot problems and what you can do to help. So you see here 10 warning signs of lack of proper nutrition and hydration. Let's take a couple minutes to talk about each of these. The first you see there is a loss of appetite. Now if your parent has always been a hearty eater, but they're no longer eating like they used to, it's really time to find out why. This is when you really want to become the detective. Because it, because it could be an underlying illness that's at the root cause, or it could be something as simple as problems with dentures that don't fit right, or having pain when chewing. So the second thing you need to look at is your parents' behavior about eating out. Do they always eat out and love to eat out, and now they rarely eat out, or they, you just find that they say, no, we don't really feel like doing that? You need to ask them why the change. What's going on that they no longer want to do that? A third warning sign that you want to look for is depression. 
And this is really key because it can be signaled by a change in appetite. That's why it's really so important to talk to your parents about changes in appetite. It can be lots of different things, and you can't make assumptions about this. The fourth sign we see is a sudden change in weight. So a weight change, and that's really losing or gaining 10 pounds in six months uh, without meaning to, could mean that something is not right and that needs to be looked at. Okay, so we're about halfway there now. Your parent may also be saving food until it's no longer safe to eat. And this is a big problem with older people. So if you're in and out of your parents' house and if it's appropriate, you might want to check for expired or spoiled food in the refrigerator. The reason I say if it's appropriate, you know, we always want to treat our aging parents respectfully and, and like they are competent adults. If your parents start to have issues with uh, their cognitive functioning, their competency, and you see some signs of dementia, that's a different story. But otherwise, you want to talk to your parents and say, hey, you know, it might be helpful if I check the expiration date in the refrigerator because they're so small, they're hard to see. So again, being respectful is key in this. Now, your parents may have professional home care workers in. If that's the case, you can ask those folks to also check the expiration dates and make sure food's OK. You know, if your parent does end up eating something they shouldn't, it really can lead to illnesses that can severely weaken them. So it's a, again, these things have a greater impact as we get older than they do even in middle age. So it's important to be aware of that. Another thing to look for is skin tone. What's your parent's skin tone like? When they're eating properly, it should look healthy and well hydrated. Lethargy is another problem. When older adults are eating properly, they can be more active and they can, you know, feel good and have energy. If they suddenly become lethargic, it could be caused by an improper diet. Cognitive problems are another warning sign. You know, older people who live alone sometimes forget to eat. And dementia and cognitive problems can lead to nutritional deficiencies. I know when my father was having problems uh, with ulcerative colitis, he wasn't eating well. And he started to get very confused. He started to have cognitive issues. And when we were able to get his nutrition back up and his nutritional status was OK, the confusion went away. So it's important to understand this can work both ways. The ninth signal you see there is if your parent's taking three or more medications. Medication can really influence both appetite and weight. So either your parent or you might want to check with their doctor to find out if medication might be a culprit in this case. And then the last warning sign of poor nutrition is a recent illness or hospital stay. Make sure that your parent or you or another family member or a professional involved in their care monitors their recovery to make sure they're eating properly. OK, so those are the 10 signs. Now what we want to do is talk about what can you do if you suspect that your parent isn't eating right. So the very best thing we can do is to have open conversations with our parents, as well as other family members that should be included in these discussions. You know, in the case of addressing nutritional needs of our parents, we want to talk to them about these nutritional needs. And we want to make sure we do it again respectfully. And we, of course, want to be aware that if they have cognitive issues, we may not be able to have those conversations the same way. You also want to talk to your parents if you or another family member are involved in grocery shopping or meal preparation. Or if when you ask your parent, they say they would like a family member involved. So given that, it's great to talk about these issues openly and respectfully and in a way of supporting their independence. That should always be our goal when we're talking to our parents about their nutritional concerns or really about any issue in their life. We have to ask ourselves, are we coming from it from the standpoint of supporting their independence and their quality of life? Because we want to do that. We don't want to usurp it. So talking with your parents will give you an opportunity to express your concerns about their nutrition and the changes that you believe they could make to improve or correct the situation. You know, if you really listen to what's going on in your parents' life that may be contributing to or causing their poor eating habits, you're much more likely to be able to help generate solutions together that will resolve the situation. You know, many times older adults are reticent to talk openly about some of these issues because they may be embarrassed or just feel like it isn't important or don't want to bother you or other family members. So we really need to be aware of that when discussing these situations that may be impacting their health or their quality of life 
but that no one's really taken the time to talk to them about and to help them assess and find out solutions. It can be tricky to find solutions to these things, and they really may need your help in just figuring out what is the problem and how to clear it up. For example, many people are surprised to learn that some health issues they've been having may be very easily cleared up with some simple dietary changes. So when talking with your parent, if you suspect medications or an illness might be to blame, suggest a visit to their primary care physician. Ask them if they might want you or another family member to go along with them to be part of the discussion. And then if, if they go alone or if you go with them, you might want to help them write a list of things they should bring with them to the doctor's appointment. And that should include things like a list of current medications, a list of any recent illnesses they may have experienced, as well as a list of the signals of poor nutrition that you've noticed. When they have that information in their hand, then the doctor can best assess the problem and they'll spend less time with the doctor trying to get those basics taken care of. You know, the doctor may just suggest some simple blood tests that can help reveal any potential medical problems. Once the doctor has conducted her analysis, she may suggest nutritional supplements, including nutritional drinks and puddings you may be familiar with. You might encourage your parent to ask if a nutritionist or dietitian would be helpful for them to talk to, especially if there are certain medical conditions such as diabetes that need to be taken into consideration during meal preparation. I know when my father was healing from surgery uh, after from the ulcerative colitis, they had him taking the nutritional supplements right along with the meals. Again, the goal was to try to get his nutritional status back, and those supplements really did help. Lastly, if you think it might be dental issues or jaw problems, you might also encourage your parent to make a visit to the dentist as well. In addition to consulting with the medical and nutrition professionals, there are many things you can do to educate and support your parent in eating properly and having better nutrition. Let's talk about some of those things now. Okay, so as basic as this may sound, many people really don't know how to make trips to the grocery store organized and productive. Now this may or may not be true for your parents. It's probably more likely to be true if your parents never done the grocery shopping or meal preparation and now is forced to because their, their spouse has died or is ill. So here are 10 tips that you can either use or if you, if you shop for your parent or that you can share with your parent about how to improve grocery shopping. Again, these tips may seem quite basic, but again, especially if your parents never had this role, you want to make sure you put yourself in their shoes and share these tips. So let's start with the first one, make a list. Making a list can help out in a lot of ways. First of all, it can help them begin figuring out what they'd like to eat for a week's time. And if they have that menu written down that they then create the list from, they're more apt to eat more during the week. This pre-planning can also really help them reduce time and money spent on food shopping. The second thing is, and we've probably already heard this one, and we've probably all experienced the consequences of doing this. If you've ever shopped hungry, you know what happens. Things end up in your cart that you can't believe ended up in your cart. I know that's happened to me many times when I've gone to the grocery store hungry. So encouraging them or you, if you do their shopping, to make sure you eat before you go to the grocery store is a great idea. It's, you're less likely to buy things you don't want. And again, that saves money and probably you'll buy more nutritional things. The third thing you can do is to review store ads, clip coupons, and organize them at home. Now this is something that you or another family member could do, or it's something that your parent could do with you or on their own, depending on their ability to see the ads and to you know, cut things out. It all has to do with what skills they still have and don't have. But if they're able to, you can encourage them to do this, or you can do it with them. Obviously, in these economic times, it's really important for many people to save money at the grocery store, and clearly shopping with coupons can do that. Also, knowing they're saving money really might help reduce the stress of the cost of shopping for them. Now, if your parent's doing their own shopping, you might want to suggest they invite a friend to go with them. They can turn a grocery shopping trip into an outing, and it may make it easier and more fun for your parent. I was just talking to uh, an older adult the other day who told me that she and a friend go shopping every week together, and what they do is they have lunch before they go grocery shopping, and then grocery shop, and then 
have some time afterwards when they both go back to each other's homes. I thought it was a great idea because they were getting together and socializing and eating out, and they were on a regular routine of grocery shopping. So something you might want to think about with your parents. Another thing they can do is to sign up for a bonus card or a discount card. This can really help them obviously get additional savings and take advantage of grocery store specials. You know, the sixth thing there is to try grocery store brands. Try the brands instead of getting uh, the, the, try the store brands rather than the brands they're used to buying. Store brands are often much cheaper and they're usually just as good. The thing is they're often placed higher or lower on the grocery shelves. So people don't see them as much. So you have to remind your parents, they just may need to look up or down for better bargains. The seventh idea is think variety. So encourage them to try new foods or ethnic alternatives. Um, one great idea is to try one new food a week. You know, this has really gotten easier in recent years. Many grocery stores now label unusual foods and vegetables, and they talk about how you can use them. Uh, another friend told me what she does is that she prints pictures out from the internet of a different vegetable every time she goes to the grocery store, things she doesn't normally try, and she'll print out a way to use it. So if your parents aren't online, that's something you could do for them and give them suggestions for how to use them. Shopping the store perimeter is really important. That's where most of the fresh, healthier foods are located. Once you get into the inner aisles, that's where most of the processed foods are. So stick to the perimeter. And as money and space permits, you might suggest to your parents, or again, if you're shopping for them, you could do this, that they stock up on sale items. Also, encourage them to be aware of the best when used by dates so they don't purchase more than they can eat by those dates. And finally, many of us are finding that we need to use our food budgets more wisely. And it's a good reminder to us and to our parents that we can really do this by trading some of the junk food for more nutritional food at a similar cost. For example, they or you may be surprised to learn that for the price of a large bag of chips and a box of cookies, they can buy a good supply of apples, bananas, carrots, potatoes, peppers, and other much healthier foods. Now, after sharing these suggestions, you might also want to share some of the food staples that are very useful for your parents to keep on hand. Let's talk about what some of those staples are now. Okay, so in general, there are 12 staples that your parent really should have on hand unless they have a condition or an illness that prohibits them eating one of these foods. They may seem like common foods for any healthy diet, but these foods hold specific, or excuse me, special nutritional value for older adults. And the good news is they can be used in a variety of recipes. So let's talk about the list. The first one there is oatmeal. Now, as you probably know, oatmeal is a great source of soluble fiber. Oatmeal has been shown to lower blood cholesterol, and it may reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. Obviously, that's really important, and if your parent likes oatmeal, it can be very easy to prepare. They can do it in the microwave or on the stove, and there's lots of ways to make oatmeal more interesting. The second food there you see are eggs. Eggs have only 75 calories per serving, and eggs contain 13 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, which is important for absorbing calcium needed for bone strength. And the fact that eggs are so inexpensive means that most older adults can afford them. Third one you see there is yogurt. Yogurt's got a lot of calcium, and that can really contribute to the calcium requirement needed to prevent osteoporosis, a serious issue for many older people. There's good bacteria that's added to some yogurt, which helps some people with digestive problems that, again, often accompany aging. The fourth food you see there is blueberries. Blueberries are among the top fruits and vegetables for antioxidants. Research on aging and Alzheimer's disease reveals that blueberries may also improve memory and coordination. And you know, the great thing about blueberries is you can purchase them frozen as well as fresh. Some people like the frozen ones better and put them on oatmeal in the morning. The fifth thing you see there is apples. The benefits of apples are numerous. In particular, we know that the pectin in apples lowers the body's need for insulin, and it may help in the management of diabetes, an issue we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes. Six, you see there fish. Bluefish, mackerel, salmon, sardines, trout, tuna, those are all low-fat, high-protein sources of nutrients. The American Heart Association recommends eating fatty fish at least twice a week to improve heart health. 
and there's been quite a bit of research in recent years on improved brain health with regular fish consumption. Chicken. We know that poultry is an excellent source of protein that contains less fat than most meats. Chicken also has niacin and selenium, which have cancer-fighting properties. And then the eighth one you see there is broccoli. Broccoli is a good source of multiple nutrients, including vitamins K, C, E, and B, calcium, iron. Broccoli has also been found to protect against cancer, heart disease, stroke, and even macular degeneration, so another great food. Soy. Nutritionists recommend consuming up to one serving a day of soy as a replacement for foods high in saturated fats. Some studies have shown that soy improves bone health. Now you want to make sure to have your, your parent consult their doctor before suggesting soy to an older adult's diet. We know that it's counterindicated in some situations, so just make sure they check with their doctor. The tenth food there is sweet potatoes and squash. Sweet potatoes have beta carotene and vitamin C and E, all of which promote healthy skin, hair, and eyesight. And squash is also a good source of beta carotene and vitamin C. And then rice. Rice is a great complex carbohydrate because it digests slowly, which allows the body to utilize the energy released over a longer period of time. That's nutritionally efficient. That's why it's so good. And finally, I don't know about you, but I think the most important part really is number 12, the dessert. As I'm sure most of you are aware, dark chocolate, when you eat it in moderation, and that's the key, may contribute to health benefits, things such as boosting HDL cholesterol, which is known as the good cholesterol, and lowering blood pressure. Despite the fact it's a high calorie and high fat food, it still has great benefits. But again, the key is moderation. Okay, so in this next slide, we're going to talk about how to use this food to make cooking and eating more enjoyable. Obviously, if your parent has all of this great food in the house and they don't eat it, it doesn't do them any good. And a lot of times people get to the point they just don't enjoy cooking or eating. So there's a nutritional expert out of the University of Maryland. Her name's Dr. Nadine Sehun. And she suggests making eating a happy event. I love that expression. She says sometimes we get so focused on what we can not eat or shouldn't eat, and what we stop doing is giving enough attention to what food represents to us. So Dr. Sehun says that food really is at the core of our lives. It's about the smell, the color, the feel, the texture, and of course it's about socializing. So all of that is what makes a meal enjoyable, and it's what we should be focusing on, what gets our attention. But as we said, that can get to be more difficult for people as they get older, especially if they're having issues with reduced taste or smell, or if they're suddenly living alone or eating alone for the first time in perhaps decades, maybe if ever. So let's talk about how you can encourage your parents to make cooking and eating more enjoyable and hopefully more appealing to them. So as you know, variety is the spice of life, and that really is true with food. So encouraging them to plan and prepare a variety of foods can really help your mom and dad stay interested in eating. The other benefit is that we know when we eat a variety of foods, we're more likely to get our nutritional needs met, because by doing that, we're choosing from a wider group of foods, from a wider group of food groups. Obviously, every older adult eating plan is individual, and so your parents have to eat what appeals to them. But it's likely if they've reached the age of 75 and they haven't developed heart disease or cancer, they're probably not going to have to make significant dietary changes. They've probably already found a meal plan that works for them. However, for them, just like for us, it's likely that their dietary plan has some room for improvement. So what you can do is suggest they make gradual changes and start out by focusing on just one thing to change. For example, maybe it's that food tastes too bland. Well, then suggest they try some natural flavor enhancers, which are also good for them. So some things that are good for you that also enhance the taste of food include olive oil, vinegars, garlic, onions, spices, including things like cinnamon and cloves, ginger and turmeric. These spices are great for people who need to cut back on salt. Now remember, as you talk to your parents about this, the goal for them is the same as for us. It's to move in the right direction, not to be perfect in our eating. But another great idea to help your parents improve their nutrition and also save m some money is to assemble healthy snacks at home in small bags using foods like nuts and seeds or low-fat cheese and fresh veggies and fruit. 
that really beats buying less healthy and more expensive prepackaged and processed snacks. And it really doesn't take long to put those together. Either you or your parents or another family member could also do some batch cooking when the food budget and time allows. For example, maybe you want to cook a large amount of spaghetti sauce and then divide it into small size portions and freeze that promptly, obviously, for meals later in the month. Another idea is to take advantage of planned leftovers to cut preparation time and save food dollars. For example, prepare a roast and serve half of it and freeze the rest, and then it can be combined with vegetables and for a quick soup or other dish later on. Another great idea is to mix up meals. Many people love breakfast any time of the day, but they don't think to do that. So you can remind your parents it's just made up that we eat some foods at one time and other foods at other times. They may want to try vegetable soup and a tuna sandwich on pumpernickel bread for breakfast, or they might want omelet and bread muffin and fresh fruit for dinner. As long as they're getting a variety of healthy foods, it doesn't matter what time of the day they eat what foods. Now, it's possible that your parent may have developed issues that make shopping or cooking more challenging. So what we want to do is talk about some possible solutions to those issues now. If your parent can't get to the grocery store or shop alone, there are a number of possibilities for help, depending obviously on their living situation, their money, their needs. So if there's no family members to help them, what we know is now today many grocery stores have delivery services. You can check on the internet, or you can give a call to a local grocery store to see who will accept phone or internet orders. Another option is to suggest that they, or ask a friend or a neighborhood teen or college student if they'd be willing to do the shopping in exchange for sharing a meal. Now, if they're hesitant to do that, you could ask. Again, this solves two needs at once. It's about buying groceries, but it's also about providing some companionship for your aging parent during the meal time. It's a great way to, to meet both of these needs. Again, as with many issues your parents face, being creative and generating solutions really can go a long way to resolving the issue. Sometimes we get stuck in kind of one way to resolve it. Either I have to shop or my parent has to shop. And there could be a really simple solution that will give them company, give you a break, and get their grocery needs met. Another service we know is becoming more common are professional cooks who prepare nutritionally balanced meals, usually a week at a time, which can be frozen. And oftentimes, they can accommodate special diets. Again, you can check the phone book or the senior center or the internet to try to find a personal chef in your area. Setting up home care services is another great way to have this need met. You know, if you use a professional home care company, many of these companies do the shopping and the meal preparation as part of their fee. And again, companionship during the meals is another great benefit to these services. And many of you may already know about Meals on Wheels. They're a great option to provide nutritious meals for people who are homebound, disabled, or who would otherwise be unable to meet their, maintain their dietary needs. These programs have really been a godsend for decades now. I know I use Meals on Wheels to help my parents at various times, and it often really was a godsend. Usually what happens is the daily meal gets delivered, and it has two meals there, a nutritionally balanced hot meal to eat at lunchtime and then a dinner, which often is like a cold sandwich and milk and you know side dishes. And in an effort both to cover costs and to maintain the older adult sense of dignity, the programs charge just a small fee based on the individual's ability to pay. Now it, it may mean that your you may find that your your aging parent mostly needs companionship. They can shop, they can do this, but they're really lacking someone to sit and have a chat with while they eat. So you know, you can suggest they contact the local senior center, the YMCA, congregation or high school, and ask about senior meal programs. And again, if they're not able to do that, you can do that. Second, if they're able, encourage them to take a class or volunteer or go on an outing, all of which can lead to new friendships and new people to have meals with. You might also encourage them to invite friends or acquaintances to share potluck lunches and dinners on a rotating basis. Not only will it add variety to everybody's diet, it's a great way to meet new people and broaden interests. I actually know of a group of friends that each makes dinner one night a week for each other. There are four of them, so they know that they'll have a good meal and company on those four nights. 
And the good news is the burden of cooking gets distributed, and they have great social contact on each of those nights. You know, another possible solution, again, this is based on your parent's level of functioning, is an adult day program. If your parent has impairments, as part of these programs, participants get both companionship and nutritious meals. My mom attended an adult day program for a number of years after she had a massive stroke. And it was fabulous because she got a nutritious lunch and snacks five days a week. This was great for her. And it was also great for my dad, who had less meal preparation than to deal with in the evenings. In the evenings, he simply did a simple meal of soup and sandwiches because they'd have their main meal provided at lunch. Hers was at the daycare program and him at the dining room of his building. And I have to tell you, it was also great relief for me as their caregiver to not have to worry about their meals and to know they were getting nutritionally sound food. OK, so now let's talk about for a moment about common problems many older adults face and your parent may face, managing diabetes. According to the American Diabetes Association, more than 18%, or to put it another way, 8.6 8 million Americans aged 60 and older have diabetes. The prevalence of this disease increases with age, and the risk of developing type, diet, type 2 diabetes also increases with age. So that's why it's important to eat a healthy diet, even if your parent doesn't have it now, to help prevent it. Older adults often face unique diabetes management challenges. For those with type 2 diabetes, age causes a decline in insulin production and an increase in glucose intolerance. So older Americans are also more likely to have complicating conditions, such as retinopathy, and that's an eye condition that goes along with diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, and kidney problems. So unlike a diet that involves what you can't eat, the good news about this is that nutritional management of diabetes usually involves dietary changes that balance moderation, carbohydrate control, and healthy eating choices. OK, so let's talk about some of the resources for people with diabetes. According to, you see this website there, dlife.com, it's a site for people with diabetes uh, and, and for those who need to take off some weight. There are dietary changes typically involved that are both calorie and carbohydrate control. So that's the difference. It's not just about losing weight. It's about managing carbohydrates as well. And this site is a really great resource for this. Also, registered dietitians, preferably one who's certified diabetes educator, that is a, that's CDE, certified diabetes educator, or is experienced in diabetes care, is really an essential resource for learning more about individualized meal planning, good food choices, all those things your parent may need to better help them manage their diabetes. And these are things, again, that if they're able, they can look into or you can look into for them. Here's the great news. The best diet for a person with diabetes is really the same kind of healthy living that's best for all of us. So like the general population, people with diabetes need to focus on whole foods that are high in fiber and nutrient dense. So this includes things like all plant foods, most dairy foods, lean meat and poultry, and fish. However, on the other side, diabetics need to really keep highly processed foods, which are often full of refined flour and sugar, to a minimum. Again, a good recommendation for all of us. The internet is loaded with lots of helpful information on healthy senior nutrition. If you want to work with your parent on this, we recommend starting with government sites, such as the National Institutes for Health that you see there, and the US National Library of Medicine. It's always a good idea to check in with your local government or your state government, as they can also help direct you to good, reputable services available in your local area. And those are things, again, you can share with your aging parent and as a family you can look at. OK, so let's talk about some next steps as we wrap up. You see these questions here in, on the screen. And these are things I'd like you to just consider. You know, with which of my family members do I need to discuss nutritional concerns? So it may be your aging parents, and it also may mean bringing in siblings to talk about this, or might be one of their grandchildren who's involved in helping out who needs to be involved in these conversations. The second question is, what resources do I need to explore to better understand the nutritional needs of older adults and how to help them manage those needs? So we gave you some resources. So think about what might you need to look at. Is there one in particular? 
And what's the next step for you after this webinar to apply this information? Is it to help your aging parent with their grocery shopping, to talk to them about meal preparation or variety? So just come up with something for yourself that you're going to do to help follow through. OK, now I'm going to, we're going to open up the, the, the phone lines, and I'm going to turn this back to Steve, who will uh, chat with you about questions. Steve? Great. Excellent presentation, Dr. Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joining us also for the Q&A portion of today's web seminar is Mary Alexander, who is the Director of Strategic Alliances with Home Instead Senior Care Corporation. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. And uh, please text in your questions for Dr. Amy and Mary using the questions box. And uh, if you are both ready, let's uh, jump right into it. Great. Uh, first question. <clears throat> I feel that my dad um, is possibly depressed after the loss of my mom not too long ago. He seems to not be eating as well as he did before, uh, possibly due to this depression. What can I do? Mm, that's a great question. You know, depression should never be ignored. So uh, I would talk to your dad about this. And uh, I know my father went through this after my mom passed. And he was quite depressed for about a year. And he and I talked about it on a regular basis. I asked him if he, if, if he wanted to go get some help, he wanted to talk to his doctor. And my father was very aware that he was grieving. And what he was doing was attending um, uh, some grief seminars and attending some support groups through hospice that he felt he was getting support. But I monitored pretty closely with him to make sure he didn't get worse. So what you want to do is, is talk to your parent about that. See, is it time to go talk to the doctor? You know, never want to ignore depression. But obviously, some drop in mood and feeling sad is a normal part of grieving. So it's balancing that that's really key and making sure you stay on top of it. Amy, and I'd just like to add, I think, you know, Amy did a great job of talking about not ignoring depression. And in my situation, we found that um, my mom, she wasn't necessarily depressed, but she was incredibly sad. And, and I think the medical professionals helped us understand the difference between sadness and depression. And we were able to do some things to help my mom during mealtime because she was always used to you know, having someone to eat with. When uh, my dad was not there, then um, we had to make mealtime different for her and not just a lonely experience. OK. Uh, speaking of kind of a, the same topic of mealtime, uh, the question for you both is, my mom doesn't seem to want to cook after years of cooking for a large family. Is there any way to motivate her to eat out less, which is fattening and expensive. <laughs> Mary, do you want to say something to that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I eat out a lot too, so I, I completely understand that. You know, sometimes we we tend to just make life easier and we make choices to do that. Um, you know, you certainly can recommend if she if she's decided not to cook. You know, here's the reality: maybe she really never loved to cook in the first place and did it because she, that was something she had to do for the family. So if you're really concerned about what she's eating when she goes out, maybe you can find some restaurants and places that can help with more nutritious type meals and better things to eat. Um, you know, you can um, make mealtime at home, at her home, more fun. You know, coming over, you know, once, you know, once in a while, once, twice a week, and, and doing that activity together, maybe get her to teach uh, to teach you some of her favorite recipes as you were growing up. So again, making it an, ex making it an experience. I think that's a, that's a great answer. And I, I do think it has gotten much easier to eat well out. You know, it takes more self-control <laughs> because you're not home with just a limited amount of food in front of you. But uh, like Mary, I, I unfortunately uh, have to eat out a lot and fortunately really like eating out. But I, I'm very aware now of the choices. And I think you know, it may be a real source of pleasure, too, for her to eat out. OK, next question. Besides oatmeal and eggs, what are some other foods that you can recommend for seniors as not too expensive but healthy? Not too expensive but healthy. Uh, Mary, are you, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, you know, I think well, that, that comes down to personal preferences. I mean, there are things, again, it, Dr. Amy talked about the perimeter of the grocery store. 
So if you look at the fruits and vegetables section, there are some fruits and vegetables that are definitely affordable. Now, if you take the larger bags of carrots instead of the ones that are already peeled and, 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 and ready for you, you're, you're saving money. So it now becomes a personal preference. But again, if you start to look at the, the perimeters of the grocery store, you will find a number of fruits and, and vegetables and even some, some things in the, the deli that are, are more healthy for you and not necessarily more expensive. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I also think, uh, you know, again, it's, there's creativity involved in this. So figure out preferences and then walk through the store and be creative. I think we all kind of get stuck in a little bit of a box in the way we shop and the way we eat. So I think creativity can help this. Okay. Next question is, uh, I'm not really sure how it happened, but I have become the primary shopper for my older parents. Um, what is a, some good insight on how to get my siblings more involved? Okay, well, I, I, I would just jump in there and say, I, you know, I'm assuming, obviously, your siblings live nearby <laughs> so that it's reasonable. And I think it's looking at having a discussion with them about, you know, your parents eating. And uh, a, lot, a lot of times the reason that other family members don't jump in to help is because they don't know we need the help. I know that sounds silly, but a lot of times caregivers assume that their siblings know and they don't really communicate that to them. So if, in just a very calm way, if you can outline sort of what the need is and, you know, how much you're doing and talk about it, is there a way to more easily divide this? I think that would be great. And I want to kick this to Mary because Home Instead has a great program that might help with us. You know, we do. You know, just in general, um, we, we at Home Instead know that sibling issues tend to be one of the biggest challenges facing um, families as seniors age. And we have a great program called the 50-50. And if you go to caregiverstress.com and see the 50-50 rule, they'll give you great tips and tools on how to help your siblings manage mom and dad's care. But to give you an, an actual situation with my family, when my mom was ill, um, you know, I happened to have the opportunity to live next door to her. I bought the house next door so I could help her manage um, her disease, and which not many people get to do. So the reality was I was closest, but but I'm I'm not a great cook, and I really don't love the grocery store. So my sister, who who happens to be a chef, would go to the grocery store once a week and do kind of a large shopping trip for her and get her the food for the week. If my mom in that week needed something small or something that she had run out of, then I did that incidental trip to the grocery store. That was my job. But it was clearly defined and broken up. And what, what made sense was my sister who did the primary shopping, she always knew what my mom had and didn't have in the house. So to break up that chore is sometimes difficult to do. So I would say find siblings to help you in other areas and everyone kind of take a defined role. Okay, next question. Some of our family members are culturally set in their ways, frying tortillas in lard and loading bacon bits, sour cream, and butter onto a baked potato. How can you teach an old dog new tricks? <laughs> <laughs> you really can't. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, I, 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 what I would say to that is, uh, you know, it, it, it's easier to introduce something that uh, is appealing and that uh, kind of is along the same line of what they're used to than to say, don't do something. So I think it's a more of a positive approach. So if, uh, if, if just some of the ways that, that they have been doing things that perhaps are less healthy, if they can just modify slightly and not lose the taste, that's the key. So I think that, again, requires the creativity piece and perhaps showing them different ways of doing it that doesn't alter you know, what they're used to and from a taste standpoint. I think people get afraid if you say to me, don't do this, don't fry this or don't do this, but you don't give me an alternative that is as good, I'm going to continue to fry it. Yeah, and, and Dr. Amy, I think that's great. The other thing I would say is, um, you can, it, it, depending on the person's age, that's really when you have an um, interesting discussion. If someone in, in their 60s, you have a better opportunity to talk with them about, look, my, and my guess is if 
your, your doctor says your cholesterol is high and this is high, these are all leading to it. Do you think we could take, instead of doing it twice a week, could we, could we move it down to once a week? I mean, if you could figure out baby steps to get to where you want to go, because doing anything cold turkey or totally shutting off um, something that you've done for 50 or 60 years or part of your uh, heritage or, or part of your family meal, very, very difficult. But if you can find ways to start to reduce those, and, you know, instead of four times a month, you do it twice a month, and then wait a little while, then you go down to once a month. So again, it's all in moderation, and I think sometimes um, we're not going to do everything that we're supposed to do, and we need to understand that. Yeah, and I love the baby steps approach. You know, we talked about that during the webinar, but, you know, small changes heading in the right direction are wonderful. Okay, next question. My mom thinks she eats healthily, but keeps a candy dish in the living room that's half empty each night, even with no guests. Should I suggest she write down every bite she eats, a la Weight Watchers, or just steal the candy dish? <laughs> well, I I would say, um, first of all, if your mom is is uh, cognitively okay, you know, she doesn't have dementia, um, she's a grown up, so we can't just steal her candy dish. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but what you could do is you know, turn it into something more fun and jokey and say, you know, I know I, I realized, you know, that um, when I kept something out like this, that I was eating more than I realized I was. I wonder if you just want to move the candy dish or think about, you know, uh, eating less of that or, but again, in a way that you would talk to an adult, not to, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to come across like the parent figure with your parent. You want to talk to them respectfully and tell them why you're even bringing it up and what your concern is and what's worked for you. So I, that would be what I would recommend. Mary? You know what, I would agree. And, you know, like Amy said, you know, make it something kind of fun. You know, one night, say, instead of candy night, it's, it's carrot night. Mom, let's just try carrots in here and see what it does. Sometimes people don't think about reaching over somewhere, taking a handful, putting it in their mouth as they're watching TV or listening to a program on the radio or whatever. It's, it's just done because they're, they're maybe a little bored, maybe it's there. Um, so I'd say, you know, try and, try and find some fun things and better snacks. Okay. Well, we are just about out of time for this webinar today, but I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Amy Dupree and Mary Alexander. Thank you for this presentation today. Thank, thank you very much. You.